Everybody watching online, thank you very much. Everybody here, thank you very much for coming. Today we're going to be talking about follow-ups and automation, how to always stay in touch with your clients. This is probably the question I get asked most often, and this is probably the most important question that you could ask and answer in your real estate business, how do I stay in touch with my clients? You know, the lead pipeline for real estate can be anywhere from two days to two years. And you got to figure out, okay, what's an appropriate way? How do I follow up? Why should I even follow up with my clients? And this is really going to help us understand, okay, what is important about it? How do we do it? Why should we do it? So a really big number, a couple of big numbers that I want to show you about why follow up is important. We talk about the lifetime value of a particular client. So in the United States, we know that in an average adult life, they're going to buy seven different homes. So let's assume all seven of those homes are here in Tampa Bay, um, and you are the realtor every single time they buy a home. An average person moves about every seven years or so, so we're talking about over a span of a 50-year career in real estate. You only work with one client ever, and they buy all seven homes from you. You know, you're talking about about $50,000 worth of lifetime income and commissions just from dealing with one client, assuming you're their realtor every single time they buy and sell a home. So that's just one client. Now imagine if we did one client... And every time we work with one client, they referred us one more client. So now we're talking over the course of the same 50 year career, that's about $8.6 million in real estate commissions just by working with an average about six clients per year, which is the average in Hillsborough County. And then every time you work with one client, they refer you one more client. So we're talking about six clients in year one, year seven, we're doubling that. So every seven years, essentially, we're doubling the number of clients we have just because we're getting one new referral from one new client. Now, we're never going to have all these clients unless we properly follow up with everybody. And so that's really the importance of this number to understand. If you want to have, over a 50-year career, this much lifetime revenue just from referrals alone, we need to follow up with people. Because if we're not following up with people, we're never going to have that much money. And if you're interested in the spreadsheet, I'll show you the spreadsheet. NAR, Zillow, and Inman News give us great stats on how we can find buyer and seller clients. Uh, great numbers here. You know, how much of a buyer and seller clients is coming from follow-up. You know, essentially, people that we've reached out to in our sphere, people that we're connecting with at networking events that we're seeing multiple times over again. You know, it's a staggering number of people that we can, can you know, secure as clients just by doing some proper follow-up. Uh, so the idea that follow-up is important, it's going to lead to a lot of clients, and the numbers bear that out. So, any questions on why follow up is important? Hopefully, we all understand that follow up is, is very important to do. Now, the better question to ask is okay, now that we know follow up is important, how do we do it? Um, so, that's the question I always get, you know, with Nico, you know, I, I know we're a sales profession, but you know, I don't want to sound annoying, I don't want to be overly pushy. You know, if someone has a two year time horizon on buying their first home, you know, how do I stay in touch with them over the course of two years without sounding annoying? Well, unfortunately, we have the non-annoying follow-up checklist. These are five simple steps that if you follow these every time you're reaching out to someone, um, you're never going to seem annoying. Step number one, be scheduled. And I'm not necessarily talking about you know, every Thursday at 2 o'clock we're reaching out to someone. I'm talking about having a game plan to where when we're reaching out to these clients, Internally, we know, okay, this is exactly where we are with the follow-up systems with this particular client. So we know if you know, they're two years out, we're doing this. If they're 18 months out, we're doing this. When they're six weeks out, we're doing this. When they're two days out, you know, we're doing this. And so that way, we have an internal schedule of what that looks like when we're following up. But, and later on, I'll show you, you know, what exactly some of those schedules look like. Point number two, choosing the right communication medium. Um, you know, in today's society, there are countless ways that we can reach out to our clients, everything from snail mail, text messaging, social media, what have you. What we need to figure out is what is the appropriate way that we're reaching out to someone with the appropriate message. So is it, are we calling someone on their birthday? You know, are we hand delivering them uh, information about the market? You know, what is an appropriate way to follow up with someone with a particular message? And so that leads us to point number three, provide relevant content. You know, that's one of the most important things when we're following up with someone is what are we delivering them? What a value we as real estate agents can provide to these people. You know, they don't really care what the weather in North Dakota is like, but they do care of, you know, what is happening with Spartan Wharf and Water Street in downtown Tampa. How is Tampa growing? You know, what's 
the market in, in Tampa look like? You know, what are some things that first-time homeowners need to be aware of before they buy a home? That's what we're talking about with, with relative, you know, relevant content. It's not just you know emailing someone and saying, hey, just follow up, see how you're doing, if there's anything I can help you with. It's no, hey, just wanted to follow up with you based on our conversation last week. You know, here's a good article about you know, interest rates in Tampa and how they might affect you. You know, then that goes from just a simple, hey, how you doing, to, hey, how you doing, here's some useful information, you know, I think that you might find valuable. Which then goes to number four, get to the point. You know, never send a paragraph from a sentence, we'll do. You know, people are busy, people, you know, especially the business professionals, you know, they care about the bottom line. They just want you to tell them what's important to them. And so, especially with sales, we don't want to provide a, a paragraph of our life story. We just want to provide the relevant information as quickly as possible. Obviously, there's time for rapport building, developing a relationship with that client, but for the most part, when we're talking about follow-up and reaching out to them you know, with communication, we want to get to the point. And most importantly, we want to provide a call to action. So it not only is it, you know, here's some good information about the market in Tampa, it's, you know, there's a conference coming up next week about the market in Tampa. Would you like to come along? And that way you can learn a little bit more about Tampa. Or, hey, I've scheduled showings this Saturday at 2 o'clock for these three homes that I think you might be interested in. Are you available to come with me Saturday at 2 o'clock? So we're giving them a clear call to action to say yes or no. You know, do you want to do something or do you not want to do something with this particular follow-up? So we follow these five steps. Be scheduled, choose the right communication, the right content, get to the point of providing that call to action. You know, if we keep this framework in mind every time we follow up, People are never going to think we're annoying because we're always providing good, valuable, consistent follow-up information. Any questions on that? Oh. All right, big number here. Eighty percent is the number of closings that require at least five contacts after the initial closing. So that means it takes at least six times to talk to somebody before they actually close. And, and you know, there's still twenty percent that require even more than six times of contact for you to actually close a deal. So it's not enough to meet someone at a networking event and hope that you're going to do business. It's you meet them at a networking event, you follow up on LinkedIn, you have coffee with them, you take them on showings. You know, then we start to get to a point where, okay, now this follow-up is actually working. So never assume just because you meet somebody once that you're going to do business with them. Never assume you've talked to somebody four times that you're going to do business with them. You know, most people, it takes six, seven times for you to connect with them and follow up with them before they trust you, like you, and want to use you as a real estate agent. So that's a, that's a pretty big number to know. And you've probably heard similar things like it takes seven times to, to talk to somebody. Well, these numbers really there in the apps. So I talked a little bit earlier about being specific or being scheduled. You know, when I talk about having a schedule, this is what that looks like. So when I'm talking about here, so for this particular campaign, this is a networking event. Let's say you like to go to networking events, you know, here is essentially what I do, my process, when I go to a networking event. This is the process that I'm following. So I have my what, who, and how, and then the particular timeline set up. So prior to the event, what am I doing? Well, I'm promoting the event on social media. I'm saying to my other interested networking friends, hey, you know, I'm going to this event at the Tampa Chamber of Commerce. You know, are you interested? Would love to see you there. Then the day of the event, you know, I'm you know, making sure that I'm making my new connections. A lot of times I go to the event facilitator and say, hey, we don't want to let you know, um, yeah, I'm really trying to connect with HR people. Do you know any HR people here in the room? You know, I'd love to get an introduction. You know, have a game plan when you're going to these things that you can get pertinent introductions from trusted sources. So that way you're not just spinning your wheels meeting random people at networking events. No, you're meeting the right people that are specifically going to help you with your business. And then yeah, we can talk about some of the philosophies and strategies in networking events, but this is essentially kind of the scheduling of what we're going to do. So now I've done something before the event, I've done something during the event, now I'm doing things after the event. So what am I doing? Well, so presumably at a networking event, I'm going to collect business cards from people. What I want to do with them is now get their contact information and follow up with them. So if that's sending a, a friend request on Facebook, connecting with them on LinkedIn, shooting them an email and saying, hey, it was great to meet you at the networking event last night. You know, really enjoyed talking to you about insurance rates and how they're going to affect the real estate market. You know, if you're free next Tuesday for coffee, love to grab a quick cup of coffee and see how we can work together. You know, something simple, quick, to the point, relevant, um, and it's going to, you know, something that I can do copy paste to a lot of other people. So that's the day after the event. Week after the event, so now I'm going to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings. So from my networking event that I had last Tuesday, 
you know, this Tuesday, now it's time for me to schedule those one-on-one -on -one appointments. When I get to those one-on-one -on -one appointments, that's really where I can learn about them, learn about their business, what their struggles are, what their pain points are, what their goals are. And I can figure out, okay, how can I help these people grow in their business? Because if I help them grow in their business, they're going to help me grow in my business. And then after that, okay, we, we have our coffee meeting. I'm going to follow up with them, say, with a handwritten note, especially if they pay for my coffee. Say, thanks for, for meeting with me last week. I really appreciate you paying for the coffee. Looking forward to, to meeting you again. And then periodically after the event, I have a networking events email that I send out to all the people I need at networking events. And so I'm going to add them to this list. So now with this one networking event, I have six different contact points with five or six different ways that I'm connecting to a particular client with different relevant sources of information and content that I'm providing them. So now a networking event to me isn't just, hey, I'm going to go have some beers and meet some new people. No, it is a detailed strategy of these are things I'm going to do before, these are things I'm going to do during, and these are the things I'm going to do after. Not only what am I doing, how am I doing them, and who am I doing them with, who am I doing them to, and now this is going to get me that specific plan. So when I look for you know, that 80% number, 80% of clients need five or six touches before I reach out to them, well, here, here is my game plan on how am I getting five or six touches with all of those people before they can actually work with me. Any questions on that? That makes sense? Good, because that's essentially how I live my philosophy in business. So hopefully that makes sense to a lot of people. So when we talk about scheduling, when we talk about follow-ups, you know, when we're talking about building that internal schedule, making sure that things work. This is a little bit of where our CRM can come in handy too. So between my calendar and my to-do list, I always know exactly what's coming up, you know, who am I doing it with, when am I doing it, what sort of notes am I going to be taking with these particular people. So that way I'm now at you know Thursday the 24th at 12:30 at a trend conference. So that means a week after the 24th. I'm going to have a notification that says, you know, make sure we're following up a lot of people at the Trends Conference. The week before, I'm going to have to make sure that I'm posting about the Trends Conference on social media beforehand. So that way, everything that I do is now scheduled. That way, I don't have to think about, oh, hey, did I make sure to send that email out to someone? Or, you know, did I send them that handwritten letter? No, it's already in my to-do list. It's already in my calendar. And then I color coordinate everything so it helps me, you know, visualize and understand what's important, what do I need to do, you know, how do I need to do it? So if you're not using your calendar, you're not using your to-do list, whether it's digital, a piece of paper, CRM, whatever it is, whatever system works for you, have a system. Because once you have a system, we can start tracking it. Once we start tracking it, then we can understand, is it working? What are the things that need help with? And what are some things that we should improve upon? And what are some things that we can spend more money in to make it even more efficient? So with the game plan, we follow up with the calendar, and then there's nothing that we can't do with that. So once we have it down, once we have it written, once we have a plan, it's going to get done. Talk about not being annoying when we have um, our follow-up. Well, we're providing relevant content to them with a specific communication medium. So what are those communication mediums? Well, I break them down into two different phases, your manual types of communication and your automated types of communication. And what we need to figure out is, okay, who and what and when deserves manual communication, and who, what, and when, and why deserves automated communication. The idea being that, let's say we have 30 people in our database. It's really easy to have a phone call with you know, everybody in our database at least once a week. You know, if you have 3,000 people on your database, it's a lot harder to have a face-to-face -face meeting with 3,000 people over the course of a week. And so that's really where we need to start having some automated systems of our communication to help with that. You know, let's say you're, you're showing properties all day, but on your calendar it says, hey, we need to reach out to XYZ client. Well, I can't reach out to XYZ client because I'm on a showing appointment. You know, automation can then start to come in handy. So now you can start doing two, three, 10, 20 different things at once. And all of your clients look like it makes it seem like you're reaching out directly to them. But really, we've just set up automated systems to reach out to people. And that's something that once we reach out with automated systems, then we're really going to start to harness the power of our database. Because it's not good just to have you know, 100, 1,000 people on our database just to have them there. It's with how am I connecting with all 1,000, 2,000 people on the database that they're effectively getting good content from people. Automation is really going to help us do that. But what do I mean by automation? Um, so one of the most successful types of automation is email campaigns. Um, you know, as, as much as people like social media and, and, and think social media is the wave of the future and Dylan will appreciate the source on this one, 
Email campaigns are nearly 40 times better at acquiring new clients than social media. So the way I look at social media, social media is a branding opportunity. You know, it's a way for me to share a little bit about myself and kind of build a presence and a profile around Nico Homan and Home and Homes. Email is a way that I'm going to secure that particular client. And so when people say, hey, I've got all these new clients on social media, you know, I say to them, well, are they really new clients or are they just ways that you're connecting with the people that you are already now? You know, same thing too, when someone says, hey, or should I spend money on a Facebook advertising campaign or a LinkedIn advertising campaign? You know, and then I say, well, let's try and figure out who our specific audience is and what we're spending on that. Because look at your Facebook page, profile. You know, if you see a link for an ad to buy a new Lexus, are you gonna buy a Lexus just because you saw a Facebook ad? Probably not. Same thing too, if you saw an ad from a realtor that says, I'll help you buy your home, you know, are you gonna click on that just because you saw a Facebook ad? Probably not. But if they know you from church, if they see you at networking events, if they saw you at a basketball league, if they see your networking events email, and now they see a Facebook ad from you, okay, then it starts to become an all-encompassing campaign. But one single social media post isn't gonna have nearly the effect as an email campaign. Why is that? Well, an email, your inbox is your precious cargo. It's your inbox. You know, everybody sees what's on social media. It's not necessarily directed one-on-one. -on -one. Whereas an inbox is absolutely directed one-on-one. -on -one. And you're more likely to open something that's directed to you, that's emailed to you, versus something that you see on social media. And these numbers are 40 times as effective email than social media. So knowing that email is pretty important, how can we utilize that to our advantage? So MailChimp is one of the automated systems that I use for my email campaign. One of the great things about MailChimp is that it's free for up to 2,000 subscribers to your email campaign. So if you have fewer than 2,000 people on your database, it's going to be free. Uh, with that, you can send you know, one-time templated emails, or you can send any number of automated campaigns. Now, for those of you that are in the uh, Zillow program, you're going to get a once-a-week email from me saying, hey, make sure you update your Zillow campaigns. If you're in a networking event, um, that I go to be part of our networking event once a month, you're going to get a networking events campaign. If you're a tenant that rents for the home and homes, and once a month you're going to get an email saying, hey, make sure that you pay your rent on time, rent the first of the month is coming up. If you're interested in buying a first time home, we have a once a day email campaign for eight days that tells you a little bit about the home buying process. That's all I mean. I don't touch it. I created it once years ago, and now it's still running. I don't have to touch it whatsoever. And the idea is that Whenever someone is interested in buying their first home, I can say, here's a link to buy your first home. Take this email course on what you need to know about buying your first home. The automated system sets it up automatically. I don't have to worry about setting up a single thing. It's going to send the first email. And 24 hours after that, it's going to send the second email. And 48 hours after that, it's going to send the, the third email. I can set it up to where if I wanted to only send an email after they click something, or only send an email after they open something. Or only send another email after they don't open something. I can set those automation preferences. If I want to send a once a year email on someone's birthday, I can do that. I don't have to remember well, when was Dylan's birthday again. Oh yeah, I set that up two years ago. He's getting an email every time it's his birthday because I can use that automatically. And so now, when we talk about multitasking automation, you know, now twenty different clients can receive a specifically tailor-made message from us that we don't even have to sit there and send. We set it up once figure out who they are, what's important to them, put them in an automation campaign, and now they're going to get some content from us. So like I said, here's some examples of some of the things that we do. Um, another good one is our onboarding system with Home and Homes. So every time a new teammate comes on board with Home and Homes, they're getting an email from me about here's some things to expect, here's some more training programs, make sure you get your headshots, your business cards, you know, all that good stuff. I don't have to worry about sending that every single time someone comes on board. I created that once. Now every time someone comes on board, it's put their email address in and they're good to go. Same thing with weekly real estate updates. Now if we want to get really technical with our website, we tie in those automated email campaigns. So with our blog, if someone is interested in receiving weekly emails from home and homes, I just post something on our blog, MailChimp curates it, and then once a week it's going to send that person, here's a list of the blog posts that home and homes had about real estate and construction news and things like that. So I don't have to think about it, I just write one blog post and now my audience gets to receive that specifically into their inbox. And so between our website, social media, email campaigns, there's a lot of things that we can do if we know who our audience is, what the message is that we're going to be sending them, and how tailor-made we want that message to be. So any questions with that? 
Another good example it would be listing presentations. So let's say that you know next Thursday we're going to deliver a listing presentation. So what I might do is create an automated campaign for listing presentations. And so two days before the listing presentation, they're going to get an automated email with a video that says, here's a little bit more about me. The day before the listing presentation, they're going to get another email with an agenda that says, here's some things that we're going to cover in our listing presentation. The day after the listing presentation, they're going to get an email from me, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. A week after, they're going to get an email from me that says, here's a monthly market report of your particular neighborhood. Here's something that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about who to use as a listing agent. So now, not only do I send them that, I send them a handwritten, you know, um, handwritten letter, phone call, a text message. Now it looks like I'm doing 100 different things at once, when really I'm only doing one or two things at once. So it's really doubling, tripling, quadrupling my marketing and my follow-up efforts without having much you know, interference with it at all. One of the great parts about you know, email campaigns and automation is they give you great reports. So we can figure out what's working, what's not working. We can figure out how many times people opened it, who clicked on it, you know, what didn't go through, which links are the most popular, how often they're clicking it, what time of day they're clicking it. And so now I can really tailor make my email campaign to say, okay, if I'm sending it to you know, 1,100 people and 41 people clicked on it, well, now I know, you know the 236 people that opened it, they're the ones that are pretty engaged my content. But the 41 people that clicked on it, those are the people that are really engaged with my content. So if once a month I'm sending this networking events email, instead of having to follow up with 1,100 people every month, I'm going to pick these 41 people to follow up with every month to say, you know, hey Joe, you know, thanks for opening up my networking events email yesterday. You know, I saw that you clicked on some of the events at, you know, Riverview Chamber. You know, I'm going to be going there next week. You know, are you going to be going? I'd love to see you there. And so now, I can get really specific on who I want to target, how I want to target them, figure out what they like to do, and how I can use that to my advantage. Because before, I'm just kind of you know throwing darts up against the wall and trying to figure out, okay, of those 1,100 people, you know, who's going to be a potentially good client for me? But now if I can you know parse it down to, well, now it's 236, now it's 41 people. Okay, now I know these 41 people are the ones that are really interested. Same thing too. These 14 people that bounced, well, maybe their email address is old. Maybe they, they changed companies. Or maybe they moved out of town or something like that. So that's going to give you just as much information to say, well, maybe if someone worked at you know Nike, and now they work at Under Armour, well, now their Nike email address is no longer working. I'm going to have to go find out and see, you know, why are they working at Under Armour? Is it because they got promoted? Is it they're moving across town? Is it moving across the country? Oh, hey, I saw you've got a new job with the Baltimore headquarters at Under Armour. I know a realtor up in Baltimore that could help you sell a home. So now just by sending one email, figuring out why their email doesn't work, I potentially use that into a client. And so now with that information in hand, I can really get a lot of detailed information on who am I targeting, why am I targeting them, and what's the, the mission that I need to use to target them. So any questions on that so far? Sounds good. Okay, so I kind of touched a little bit why you should create an automated email campaign, but in case you didn't know, you should create an automated email campaign. So let's say you need a potential home buyer, and they tell you they want to buy a year from now. How do we stay in touch with them between now and then? So this is kind of where I open up. What are some, if someone, if I'm a home buyer, and I say, I'm interested in buying a year from now, how do you stay in touch with me? Um, email, maybe call. Text, I would sure, absolutely. And so then we've got to figure out, okay, how often are we doing it? What's the messaging that we're delivering that, you know, am I making sure that I'm tracking all of those people? Now let's say you have 30 of me out there at the same time and say, hey, so I'm interested in a year from now, 18 months from now, nine months from now, you know, 24 days from now. You know, how do we create those campaigns to where we're constantly following up with someone and providing them that good information? Well, we can always go back to the non-annoying follow-up checklist to make sure that we're being scheduled, that we're using the right communication, and providing them good content with a good call to action. Any questions on that? Cool. Well, that was about... Oh, I forgot about this one. So this is something I'll share with everybody, too. But we talked about you know, creating that follow-up campaign with a networking event. Well, here's some of the specific things that we might do with a long-term potential buyer. So if they say, you know, I'm interested in, in maybe a year from now, Okay, so once a quarter, I'm going to send them an automated email with a monthly, you know, or a quarterly market conditions report. And once a month, I'm going to send them things to do before you're buying a new home. 
know, I'm going to find out when their birthday is, when their anniversary is, when some sort of special event, and then I'm going to send them either a phone call or a handwritten letter saying happy birthday or something like that. Then once we're starting to get a little bit closer to the timeline, you know, maybe six months out, maybe five months out, I'm going to start searching the MLS and start searching Zillow and, and finding some useful listings and start texting and say, hey, you know, I know you're interested in High Park. You know, here's a cool new listing at High Park that you might want to go check out. And every two weeks, I'm going to send them information about mortgage rate updates. And then whenever something new comes up, I'm, you know, I'm going to send them, you know, send a Facebook message, uh, you know, LinkedIn. But, you know, here's some cool news about a new restaurant that's opening up in High Park that you might be interested in that. And so now we can tailor this. And so if we have a potential long-term buyer, now we know what we're sending them. We're sending it this particular way, this particular time frame. And so now we can really track who's getting what, when are they getting it, and how are they getting that information. And then again, we can do this with every single, every single type of, of client that we have, whether it's a listing agent, whether it's a referral client, whether it's a renter client. You know, we can develop these timelines, we can develop these messages that we're delivering to these particular people. So one of the questions I always get asked is, so what information do we send them? How do we send them this information? So what I always like to do is every time I find a good news source out there, I like to subscribe to their newsletter. You know, not only for me to get educated on what's going out there in the market, but for me to be able to send some information to somebody else. So if I have um, you know, a, a luxury client, uh, you know, I subscribe to the Institute for Luxury Real Estate, and maybe there's a new luxury real estate report out there, I'm going to send them, hey, you know, this one to let you know, here's what the market says is going to happen in 2019 for luxury real estate. I thought you might want to know that information. Great tool that I use that I would recommend is Google Alerts. So let's say Dylan Bridges is my client. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a Google Alert. So every time Dylan Bridges you know, comes up in the news, I get an email that says, hey, Dylan Bridges was just featured in the Tampa Bay Business Journal because he got a promotion at work. Well, now I don't have to go searching for that information. Google's going to search for that information. Give me an email that says Dylan just got a promotion. Now I'm going to email Dylan and say, hey, Dylan, I just read an awesome article at the Tampa Bay Business Journal. Look how cool I am because I did all this research on you. And congratulations on your promotion when really it was Google doing all the work. I just happened to send you a quick email and say congratulations. But you're going to remember that. You're going to remember that, oh, yeah, Nico sent me an email. You know, congrats. You know, he's very well read. He reads the Tampa Bay Business Journal. He's a smart guy. I'm going to use him as my real estate agent. And so you're know, really tailoring that message to your particular buyer. You know, houses are a great one for design, interior design, you know, renovation. So if you know that you have a buyer that's looking to get a fixed rubber, you know, great articles on the house, or they just want to have, have one today, you know, we'll see you know, like 10 upgrades for your farmhouse kitchen or something like that. And so if you know someone is interested in, you know, farmhouse kitchens, you know, we send them this great article. It says, here are 10 things that you need to be concerned about in your new farmhouse kitchen. So now I don't have to spend all this time writing the content myself. Now I'm curating this content and then specifically delivering it to the people that need it when they need it. With that, now I'm done with my presentation. Any questions on, please, you're too kind. Any questions on follow-up, automation, you know, anything that you've seen in the past that works, doesn't work, or as far as ways to follow up and stay in touch with people? Anything on that? Any questions on the live stream? Yes, Jack, to answer your question, I will absolutely be sharing the slides so you can follow along there. I also have this in podcast and video form coming up soon, too. Um, any other questions? Yep. So, say you're, you just want to start an email campaign, you have it just from the ground up. Yep. It's the first thing you're starting with. It's the first thing you're doing. So, the very first thing is I'm picking my audience. So, who am I sending that to? So, you're starting your automated campaign. Who do you want to send something to? And then we say, okay, so let's say you want to send an automated campaign to your basketball league. You know, what are you going to send them? You know, are you going to say, I might find something that, you know, the Institute of Life Real Estate, they have a report, you know, every time celebrities buy homes. And so I might find a section there every time an NBA star buys a, you know, a new home in South Beach. You know, I'm going to say, hey, did you see this article? Dwayne Wade just sold his home in Miami for $8.2 million. You know, and so now I have a particular audience. I have a particular, you know, content strategy that I'm reaching out to them that my audience is going to find relevant and, and useful. And so then we kind of really have to develop it as a whole is who's getting this and what are they getting in that sense. And so now I have my audience, now I know my content, now I can create this automated campaign that's going to be helpful for them. So you would say that it's almost better to have a broad message that's to the point for your audience than to have something that's going to apply to just a couple. 
right? So that also depends too. So um, you know, you can create an automated campaign for two thousand people. You can create an automated campaign for two people, um, and you can have them going simultaneously. So let's say you have you know first time home buyers in Seminole Heights, but you also have first time home buyers in Clearwater Beach. Well, maybe you have an automated campaign for first time home buyers, but you also have an automated campaign for new things that are happening in Seminole Heights. Well, all four of those clients are going to get the new home buyer information, but only two of those clients are going to get the Seminole Heights information. Or maybe it's vice versa. Maybe you're, you're specifically targeting Seminole Heights, so a lot of people are going to get the information there, but only a few people are going to get you know, automated campaigns. You know, that's the beauty of automated campaigns. You set it up once, and you set it and forget it, essentially. You just add the people to the list, and now they can start to automatically get that information. So, you know, I have... Campaigns that go to as little as two people and then as much as you know eleven hundred people. All right. Yeah. And we have some internally too. So like the first time homebuyer ones, you know, home and homes has a first time homebuyer campaign. So if any you know teammate with home and homes has a first time homebuyer, you can send them that link and say, hey, sign up for this first time homebuyer campaign. Or you know, someone that's interested in the rental process, you know, we have one as a company. You know, here's information about the rental process. And then if you wanted to specifically have one that says, you know, this is how I handle the first time homebuyer you know, process, then we can tweak it to say, okay, this is specific to Bridget. You know, here's her specific you know, things and steps that she follows up with. Yep, we can easily do that. And again, it's automated, copy paste, good to go. All right. You know, I get Absolutely. <laughs> All right, anything else online from everybody here? If not, we'll start the mastermind session after that. If not, all right, good stuff.